Hey everybody, we're gonna be continuing our omnification of Sekiro. Today we're gonna to be implementing the apocalypse system for the player, so enjoy. All right, so here's what we did uh, last time. We uh, uh, found the place where it's, it's calculating the damage to apply to the player's current health, right here on this uh, area of code. It's for Sekiro. Uh, RDI, the register RDI, contains the two's complemented fo uh, form of the damage about to be applied to the character. So, let's hook up our apocalypse system. If you're curious about what the game is gonna look like after the apocalypse system is uh, hooked up, well, I'll just wait until the end of the video. Otherwise, um, if you've watched any of my other gameplay, it's, it becomes very obvious where the apocalypse system becomes active. All of a sudden you see a uh, event log above you on the top of the screen um, that uh, shows hits being done to the player. Um, you see a number of other things as well. Let's uh, first take a look at uh, what, you know, what's required for the player portion of the apocalypse. What is the player portion of the apocalypse though? It is um, my, the system of code that I wrote that takes over when uh, the players hit. There's also the enemy apocalypse. It's a uh, portion of the code that takes over when the enemy's getting hit. We'll be implementing that um, after uh, we finish uh, the player apocalypse. So all of my uh, common functions that I have declared as game neutral, um, they're all in this common assembly file that I've uh, basically uh, created, which contains all the stuff that I copy paste in between games. It was not until the last game, Monster Hunter World, that I actually game neutralized the apocalypse function. So this will be the first, uh, or the second game, I guess we were uh, actually gonna be using this into. But uh, it should work just fine. None of the code in here, this is the player apocalypse system function right here, is anything that's dependent on the particular game. It relies on all the parameters that you provide it. Where these parameters come from, the values for these parameters, that is of course game de you know dependent, you know, like where the player's coordinates are stored, you know, um, where the health is stored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we provide it these parameters um, in, in the form that it expects, it's gonna work just fine. The return result of the player apocalypse system function is the updated damage, because that's what, what it does really. It changes the damage going to the player. And uh, the secondary return uh, value here is in the EBX register. That returns the, uh, the updated health before damage. So what that means is in the function of code that's about to apply damage to the player's health, there's two variables in play here. There is a variable that is, is holding a temporary value for the health, and there's also a variable that's holding the damage. And what that temporary variable for the health is, it's going to treat that as the actual character's current health. So if we actually want to heal the character here for some reason, we want to set that to that updated value then. Let's say I wanted to heal the character to full health, well, I'm going to want to zero out the damage variable, and I'm going to want to set that uh, current health to uh, whatever their max health is. So let's work on getting uh, the player apocalypse system um, into Sekiro. So I'm going to go in my common assembly function here, and I'm going to copy um, all the functions that I care about. We're going to copy the random number generation function, which is typically used by all my code. And we're going to copy the um, player apocalypse system here. Let's paste that into the Sekiro code here. There you go, we've uh, pasted the uh, player apocalypse function into the Sekiro code. Now uh, paste in the cleanup uh, code for this. There's the cleanup code, let's paste that in. There we go, that cleaning, the cleanup code is in there as well now. All right, all we gotta do now is hook into that player apocalypse system. And where do we do that from? We do that from the required location for the initiation code, which is the place where damage is being calculated. And we did that during the last video. I created a little uh, part in my code here called initiate player apocalypse, which is set to occur in that little area of code that is um, calculating the damage. All right, so let's work on uh, hooking up the code. So how do we hook up the code? What's, what, what do we have to worry about the parameters, right? So let's take a look at each parameter required by the player apocalypse system function. The very first uh, parameter we wanna push uh, to the stack to call this fun function is the uh, damage amount. Almost deleted that right there. So damage amount, where's that? Well, it's in the RDI, right? Okay, now um, remember, What's in the RDI is the two's complement form of it. Um, how can I get that into just a normal number, right? Again, it's like uh, I showed you kind of the uh, the manual calculation, how to do it with your calculator to figure out what it represents. Is there a simple way to do that in assembly? Yes, there's a very simple way to do that in assembly, actually. What we're actually going to do is uh, 
we're going to uh, back up what's in RDI right now. And then we're going to make use of the NEG uh, assembly instruction. And this will essentially perform a two's complement operation on the value that's in RDI, and it will store it in that uh, register. So basically, it'll uh, change it from uh, a negative um, 47 uh, or negative 48 damage, which is what getting hit by one of the guys outside the starting area does, to 48. The damage is 48. So that's going to be the first parameter that we pass to the execute player apocalypse. How do we pass as a parameter? It's very simple. We simply push it. Is that all we truly need to do is just push this integer damage amount? No, it's not. Um, actually, the uh, player apocalypse function uh, expects it to be a floating point number. So uh, we need to actually convert it into a floating point number before we can push it as a function parameter. So I'm going to need an, uh, an SSC register in order to store that floating point number temporarily before I push it correct. So let's use uh, XMM0, you know, the first one. We're going to want to back up the contents of XMM0. Let's subtract a total of 16 or uh, 10 hex from the stack. And um, let's store the current contents of the XMM0 register onto the stack. And here at the bottom, we're going to restore uh, the contents of XMM0 as it is um, on the stack. And then restore what the stack was before we started screwing with it. So now XMM0 is free for us to screw with. So here we're backing up uh, what RDI is before we screw around with it. We're actually going to want to set that to the updated apocalypse return value. So it actually doesn't matter whether we um, back that up or not. So how about we just not back it up? We're going to perform a two's complement operation RDI, get that into a positive number. And we're going to convert it to a floating point number. So to do that, we do CBTSI2SS. That basically converts a double word integer to scalar single precision floating point value or from int to float. Also, we're gonna wanna do a two's complement on EDI, not RDI. We just care about the first uh, 32 bits. Okay, here we have the damage being done to the player. It's uh, stored on the XMM0 register. Now, let's push that as a first function parameter to the execute uh, player apocalypse. How do we do that though? It's XMM0. You can't just do a push XMM0. That doesn't work. This only works with uh, registers, your, your standard uh, CPU registers. Well, the SSC register takes up a total of, uh, what is it, 128 bits. The part of the uh, register that we need to push to the stack uh, takes up 16 bits. What we do is we first uh, adjust the stack itself, uh, 10 or 16 bytes. And we're, then we're just going to move um, to the stack uh, the current value that's next to M0. And this is essentially now a parameter being passed to our function. Hooray! So that is the very first uh, parameter for the execute player apocalypse function. So what's the next uh, parameter that we have to worry about uh, for the player apocalypse? The next one is the, the player's health. We're right here. Um, this is actually uh, this is actually supposed to be the floating point representation, though, of the player's health as well. So just like we had to do for the damage amount, since Sekiro likes to deal um, in integers typically, not floating point, we um, are going to have to convert our health to floating point too before we pass it along. So how do we do that? Well, uh, when this function is called here, the player's health will have hopefully already been discovered by our other code. It should be pointed to by the pointer that we created called player health. Before we um, write any more code to pass parameters, let's just do a little bit of a, some register preservation code. Um, we know that the function is going to write to rex, correct? As a return value. It's also going to use uh, rbx. Technically, it's gonna use ebx on rbx, but we're gonna wanna back up the entire register. Um, so let's back up these two registers there. And uh, of course, we'll then pop them down here before the original code starts running. So any work that I want to do in order to uh, prepare the parameters, I'm going to want to do in this little section up here. Um, from here to uh, right here, this is where all the code is going to exist that's actually going to be arming the parameters for the function to be called. I want to keep it separate, just because um, I might be manipulating the stack up here while I'm preparing it. 
and uh, I want it to be all fed to the stack in one clear shot below. So here's where we uh, prepare the damage being done to be uh, passed to the uh, function. Let's now prepare the uh, health. Um, the player's uh, health will be found in the player health uh, pointer right here. Now remember, player health itself will uh, point to the address of the pointer. Okay, if we dereference it, so to speak, um, this will now point to the address that the pointer points to, correct? So this would point to the base of the health structure. I could just simply move that then to REX, right? So REX is now set to the address of that um, health structure. Of course, then to get the actual uh, health value, we would actually need to do REX plus the offset from the base of the health structure to that health value. If we look at our uh, cheat table that we got going here already, we see that the offset's, uh, whoops, 130. Let's change the offset, 130 from the base. So this code right here then would uh, leave us with RBX having the player's health. But this isn't uh, the most kosher way of doing things here, particularly if the, this address right here of player health, if it's more than two gigabytes from where this code actually resides, this will no longer work. It's too big. Uh, you run into some limitations if you do that. So we might as well just write the code to be as future-proof as possible because it kind of sucks to have to um, do this in the future. So what does that instead look like? Well, instead of just dereferencing it here, which would cause the error, we're gonna just load the address of the pointer to REX. And then we set RBX to the address of the uh, health structure, like this, so. And then basically RBX plus 130, that'll be my health. Remember though, uh, the health uh, is expected to be in floating point by the player apocalypse function. So we're gonna need another SSE register here. In order to do that, we're gonna have to back up uh, another one. Let's back up XMM1 now. And down here, we're gonna be restoring uh, XMM1 from the stack. Now that we freed up XMM1, we're gonna use that to uh, store our actual health value at. So we're gonna do another convert um, from a double weird integer to single scalar floating point or whatever. <laughs> uh, we're gonna be uh, reading uh, RBX plus 130 into that. There we go. Now XMM1 contains our uh, health value. So let's pass that as a parameter to the function down here. Right after we're passing the uh, uh, damage being done, which is right there. Let's take up another 16 bytes. Let's do move D, RSP, XM1. There we go, that's the second parameter. So third parameter here, guys, we need to um, push to the function what value the uh, player's health is when it's maxed. So we actually don't know what that is in Sekiro. We've uh, found what the current health is, but we actually haven't found what the player's maximum health is. Uh, that's usually stored somewhere very close to the uh, health itself. Let's see if we can find it. We got the, the table open up right here um, with the player's health. Uh, remember this, uh, this current health here is set to 130 off from the uh, player health uh, struct. Let's take a look at the player health struct actually and see if we can figure out what the maximum health is from that. So here's a new uh, dissect structure view. Let's uh, put into it uh, player health. And um, let's define a new structure here. So 130 has the, uh, the current health of the character. And typically, um, the maximum health is gonna be really close to the player's, uh, max, uh, the player's current health. So we have some values that are very close to the player's current health here. Um, let's just update the, the struct right here. It's the current health. So it's either gonna be 134 or 138. So one way we can figure it out is let's just try screwing around with one of these here. And when I uh, update it, um, I'm gonna expect the bar at the, at the bottom of the screen to um, expand. So here you can see the bar at the bottom of the screen down there. Let's just set this to 340, see what happens. Okay, just reset back to 320. There we go. This would look like to be the actual maximum health then. Uh, just to prove this, uh, 
Here's the current health as we know. See if I lower it to 300, you see it gets a little bit uh, lower. A little bit of black in that bar. Let's set this to 340, right? It gets capped at 320 because this actually decides what the maximum health is. So we found the maximum health. It is basically uh, in the player health struct with an offset of 138. All right, so in order to uh, pass the uh, max player health to the function, we're gonna need to convert it to fluent point. So let's back up one more uh, SSE register. We're gonna be backing up XMM2. This is where we restore XMM2. So let's arm XMM2 with the player's max health. We already have the address to the player's uh, uh, health structure that's stored in um, RBX. So here we're also going to convert uh, RBX uh, plus 138, which holds the max health to XMM2 as a floating point value. And um, there you go. We're going to pass that as a parameter then underneath uh, the code that passes the, uh, the current health. Do another 16 bytes here. And there we go. We're now passing the damage being done, the player's uh, current health, and now the player's max health. Then that means there's only one remaining uh, parameter to pass. Then we have everything we need. And the remaining parameter is gonna be a fun one. This needs to be the player's coordinates. This needs to be actually point to the player's coordinates um, as they uh, exist in memory. And it needs to be aligned at the X coordinate. So that means is, as you know, typically when we're dealing with pointers and all that, we have the bases of the struct, right? And then we have to uh, go down a little bit, look at a little offset from that base, and uh, that's where the value that we care about is. Um, for the X coordinate, the base of the struct is the player chords, pointer, and then um, the offset is 80 until we reach the uh, X chord. When you, what we need to do is we need to pass a pointer where it's aligned at the X coordinate so that an offset of zero will point to the um, X coordinate, not an offset of 80. And then the, the apocalypse function is going to treat the, uh, is going to use that and it will know how to find the other coordinates because they're typically going to be four bytes apart. Those are just floating point values. 99.9% .9 of the time in games. All right, so how do we, uh, how do we realign the player coordinates? So in this code here, we'll have already have discovered where the player chords are and um, we have them uh, uh, being pointed to by our pointer that we created, player chords. This is done in the previous hooking function, correct? So we already used REX and RBX uh, to get the player health. Let's just reuse them to get the player chords. I'm gonna move the uh, address of the player chord um, uh, pointer, store that in REX, then I'm gonna dereference that value. So then we get the address of the base of the structure, the location structure. We're gonna store that in RBX, okay? Now I need to pass the function the address of where the coordinates are. And I want it to pass it the address specifically where the X coordinate is. Then it's gonna treat that as a new structure and it will be aligned at the X coordinate. So the way to do that is we're gonna make use of the load effective address instruction instead, which is going to load the effective address of um, the base of the player struct, uh, location struct plus um, 80. So we'll load that into REX again. And it's gonna be RBX plus 80. And now REX will point to um, the start of the X coordinate in memory. And then down here, after our third parameter that we're passing, which is the player's maximum health, we just simply uh, push um, REX. And that's it. We have all the parameters wired up and armed onto the stack. And now we can call the um, player apocalypse function. And that's done very simply. Call execute player apocalypse. And there you go, it will now be executed. So once it's done executing, um, remember it's gonna re return an updated uh, damage amount in the REX register. And it's going to have the what the player's health should be prior to applying that damage in the RBX register. So let's act on that stuff here. So don't don't forget the up the damage needs to go to the RDI register, and it's currently going to be in the EAX register. So remember though, it's actually stored as a floating point. We need to convert it back into an integer. So how do we do that? Well, first let's take uh, 
this uh, updated value and we're going to uh, put it back into the XMIM0 register so we can do some operations onto it. So remember before we were converting from double word integer to single scalar floating point, we want to do it the other way around now from single scalar floating point to double word integer. So instead of CVTSI to SS, we do CVTSS to SI. The destination for this operation is going to be uh, the EDI register, which is what holds the damage, remember. And of course, we're searching for maximum zero. Now it's going to be back in the integer form. Of course, we're not done here yet. Remember, it has to be in two's complement form, so we're going to um, do another uh, neg operation on that, neg EDI. Okay, now it's prepared to be passed down for secure for processing. The last thing we want to do is we want to update the player's uh, current health um, prior to having the damage applied to it. So um, the player's current health before having the damage being applied to it is actually in the um, REX register. So we're actually uh, backing up the REX register here and then restoring it. Um, we actually don't want to do that uh, because it's going to always be updated to be um, whatever the apocalypse function is returning here. So I'm going to get rid of this push statement here. I don't care about backing up the RX register. And um, we're going to set it up right here. So um, EBX actually contains the uh, updated player's health. So um, let's move that to uh, the XMIM0 register, EBX. And I'm just going to convert that to an, an integer form as well. And we're going to store that in the uh, EAX register. And that, my friends, is a complete impl implementation of the player apocalypse initiation function in Sekiro. Did that not take long at all? It's so much easier now that um, we have a game neutral function here where all the actual hard work's being done. Uh, next, uh, let's uh, inject it into the game and see what works and what doesn't work. And if it all works perfectly great, fabulous. All right, I reloaded the uh, cheat table with the updated code. First of all, before I inject the code, let's make sure it all compiles correctly. We just do that by saying change script and hitting that okay there. It assembles correctly, great. Well, let's see if it injects properly. All right, looks like everything was working as before. The game has not crashed yet. Very good. Now let's uh, get hit by something. All right, you can see the uh, apocalypse event log above at the top of the uh, screen right there. That's how it appears in the stream. Currently what's in it is just a console command to get it to display. Disregard that, it'll be gone a little bit. Let's go get whacked by something and uh, see what happens. Well, crashed. Let's debug the crash. All right, guys, so uh, what was causing the crashing was just some issues with the stack math. Um, there have been some changes to the uh, game neutral uh, apocalypse uh, implementation um, since I originally wrote it. And um, we're actually gonna be a little bit uh, tighter in terms of the uh, me uh, memory addressing of the parameters. So um, instead of uh, allocating a whole 16 bytes on the stack per SSE register, we're just gonna allocate eight bytes which is how much each floating point file will take up. And uh, this should work great now. All right, we have the code reloaded. Let's see if this uh, works though. I'm just gonna go on and get aggro from these guys. If it doesn't crash, then we're good. And we didn't crash, great. Okay, well let's see if the general part of the apocalypse function works. That's by getting hit. Let's turn on that log right there and let's see if it starts to be uh, populated. All right, let's go get whacked by a bad guy. Hit me. And we can see here, it's working. If we look at the top there, uh, the enemy hit us, risk of murder roll was engaged, and we rolled roll to three, so it's just normal damage. 48 damage to the player. Hey, it works great. Very awesome. Um, let's go through all the various individual cases uh, to see how they affect the game. So here is each and every outcome that can happen when the player is hit, when they're hooked up to the apocalypse system. We have the die landing on one to four, which causes extra damage. In this game here, it's set to two times damage. We have the teleportitis effect. We have the risk of murder roll, which has either normal damage or 69 times damage. And then we have the sudden orgasm. So let's capture each and every uh, potential outcome in the game and uh, see what it looks like. Let's get hit again. Oh, 
Well, this did the teleportitis to our character. Where the hell are we? Wow, we are somewhere. <laughs> okay. The teleportitis uh, function seems a bit extreme here. I just had an idea though. So uh, there's a few parameters in the uh, pocket system function, which are again, geared to make the game more uh, portable between games. And I think the one that I just remembered here that might have some bearing on this here is uh, there's a uh, multiplier that'll get applied to the uh, offsets that get applied to the coordinates during the teleportitis effect. And we probably want to adjust that. So the one we care about is this uh, teleportized uh, displacement multiplier. This exists because of the coordinate system in Monster Hunter World. Um, uh, coordinates in that game were very different from normal games. Uh, in the sense that like moving the character, um, if you wanted to move the character for like five units uh, north, you typically would have to do it uh, to a degree of 500 times the, the value you'd have to apply to the character in a normal game. So that's why we have this displacement multiplier here. So let's just set that back down to one, um, basically disabling that multiplier. Let's reload the hack. Let's get back to uh, testing out the various outcomes. Hopefully we'll get another teleportitis here. Get another risk of murder with normal damage. Oh, nope. just what happened right now is the orgasm effect and we fully healed to full health. Yet another orgasm. Very lucky. Ooh, and what we just witnessed here was the 69 effect. We were 69 for 3,312 damage. Pretty damn good. Note that the character has a max health of 320 here at the start. So that effect is working good. Another 69, ouch. Gotta love that 69, baby. There's that teleportitis. You see it bumped us up a little bit in the air. Let's see a cooler teleportitis though. I wanna see myself get launched. Ooh, there's a nice launch. Good, ooh, another teleportitis. I wanna see it do some damage to my character. One nifty feature here is that uh, there's an option uh, that disables negative vertical displacement in a game. If you have that enabled, then basically the character won't be able to be, be teleported below where they're currently standing. Um, let's turn that on and see what happens. I'm curious. Okay, we have negative vertical displacement enabled now. Let's uh, let's get smacked around a bit and see what happens when we get teleported underneath the ground. Either it works or it doesn't work with the game. That's with negative vertical displacement enabled. Pretty fucking awesome. Again, the goal of Omnification is to change the game into an absurd carnival of death. And that, my friends, is fucking absurd. Well, everybody, we got all the various uh, outcomes and uh, effects that the player apocalypse can um, uh, cause upon the player tested. And that's a big wh whopping success. Probably some more testing we have to do and all that. For now, we can move on to uh, adding the enemy apocalypse. And we'll cover that in the next video.